So as Jill said at the start of the service, we continue today thinking about Easter. We've been looking at John's Gospel, and I want to bring two readings to you. One is, is from John and part of his Easter account, and the other is from Isaiah. And the thing that connects these two readings, the New Testament and the Old Testament, is the idea of being sent, being commissioned by God. So John 20, 19 to 22, first of all. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to read the first eight verses of Isaiah 6, which tells us about Isaiah's calling. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the trabe of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy. When, when things are said three times in Hebrew, it means these things are utterly holy, absolutely. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongues from the altar, and with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Just to say, plural here. The Old Testament often talks about God as a divine counsel. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Father, thank you for your word. I pray as we meditate on your word, that we will hear you speaking and that we'll have soft hearts willing to receive what you're saying to us today and ready to respond and bring you glory. Amen. When William Carey suggested in the late 18th century that we ought to go and take the good news of Jesus to the farthest corners of the world, he was met with a strong rebuke from a senior minister whom he deeply respected. Sit down, young man, he was told. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do so without consulting you and me. The senior minister, Dr. John C. Ryland, went on to denounce Carey, and I quote, as a miserable enthusiast. See, Baptists don't always get it right. Fortunately, Carey didn't sit down, at least not for long, and he continued to argue that God was calling the church to take the message of Jesus to all people everywhere. Carey himself responded to this conviction and he went as a missionary to India and spent four decades serving the people of India. He, he was a brilliant linguist and he was able to uh, learn local languages, form the grammar for those languages and translate the Bible as well as many um, other documents into, uh, into those languages. He's, uh, he's known in Protestant circles as the father of modern missions. The Lord asks Isaiah, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah responds, here am I, send me. William Carey responds, here am I, send me. I wonder how we respond to God's invitation to go and share Jesus with the world around us. In our passage from John's Gospel, it's one of John's resurrection accounts, and John places this event in the evening of the day of resurrection, the empty tomb, the meeting with Mary in the garden. And John, who writes theologically, wants us to know 
that this is a new start for creation, a restart or a recreation that is taking place here. He deliberately frames the telling of the story to point us back to the creation account in Genesis. So just as the Lord God breathed life into Adam in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, so Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit on his disciples. He brings them spiritual life, recovering what had been lost in the fall. And John is, is clear to tell us this happened on the first day of the week. Now, if you read Luke's account of the resurrection and the events after that, Luke tells us the outpouring of the Spirit came at the festival of Pentecost a few weeks later. I, I don't think the first outpouring of the Spirit comes in two different occasions. Um, neither do I think that what happens in John is merely symbolic or even, if you like, just a little bit of an outpouring, but the, the great outpouring is to come. I think John tells us this way because he wants to make a theological point that what is happening in the resurrection of Jesus and in the giving of the Spirit is a restart, a reboot for creation. The new creation in Jesus has begun. The old creation, because of sin entering into the world, had fallen away from God, but now everything is new. And it is a, a recreation that is taking place. And Christians began to worship on the Sunday. Uh, of course, uh, the early Christians would have all been Jewish. They'd have been used to worshipping on the Sabbath, which was um, dusk on, on the Friday evening to dusk on the Saturday evening. But it made sense to the early church. And for the evidence we have, the early church began meeting on the Sunday because it was the first day of the week. It was the first day of the new creation in Jesus. Furthermore, the climax of John's gospel, as you trace it through, and the way the whole story is told, it, it tells us that it's been building up to this moment. So in John chapter 1 and John chapter 3, it tells us about Jesus, that he is the one who will baptise with the Holy Spirit. And then in John 7, at a, at a festival, Jesus stands up and he declares, All who are thirsty, come to me and drink. Rivers of living water will flow from within them. Just note the direction there. Rivers of living water will flow within those who come to Jesus, out of us to other people. And then it clarifies in the next verse, saying, by this he meant the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then in chapters 14 to 16 of John's Gospel, Jesus promises that he will send another helper. He says, don't be sad that I'm going, because actually it'll be better for you. I'm going to send you another helper. And he talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we have the climax of what John is, uh, has been leading to throughout his gospel, that here, on the evening of the resurrection, Jesus meets with his disciples in this upper room, and the Holy Spirit is poured out. This is where he's been heading to all along. We, as Jesus' disciples, we receive, as Jesus disciples, we receive the Holy Spirit, and the new creation has begun. And filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus sends them out. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Let me say then, I believe Jesus wants to commission all of those who put their trust in him. He wants to send us all into the world to share the good news of Jesus. It's not just for a few keen Christians. Many of you know that I quite like going up to the football at, at the Etihad Stadium in Manchester. I went up last weekend. Uh, we beat Watford, Watford comfortably. Um, there were 22 players on the pitch. They were running round like mad things. They exerted energy on both sides, really tried hard. Lots of the players desperately by the end of the game in need of some rest. There were 54,000 people in the stand who at times had much better ideas of what the players should be doing and giving all sorts of advice as to how they could do this better. And some of those fans were much desperately in need of some exercise. The church has been seen in those sort of terms at times that actually there's this huge crowd of people telling others what they're to do, but actually only a few people who, who are out there doing it. That's not the calling we have as Christians. We're not to be like that. We are all called to respond to Jesus' invitation. We are all called to say to God, here am I, send me. We are all called to be witnesses of Jesus. A few years ago, and some of you might remember this, I accompanied an Iranian asylum seeker to an appeals hearing. 
Um, what was fascinating was that the barrister for the Home Office at this appeals hearing seemed to understand what a, the responsibility of a Christian more than a lot of Christians get what their responsibility is. So the barrister said in front of the court, he said, well, if you have converted to Christianity, I understand that Christianity is a proselytizing religion where you will be required to share your faith. And therefore, I understand that if you go back to Iran, then you will have to share your faith and then you will face serious difficulties. I get that. And then he proceeded to say, but is your conversion genuine? He got it. Really interesting. The Home Office gets what Christians are meant to do. Question is, do we get it? You see, Jesus commands all his followers that we might be sent to share the good news of who he is with the world around us. Will we say to him, here am I, send me. For most of us, responding to God's call to being sent primarily involves responding to the things God wants us to do right in the places where we are. For most Christians, it isn't about going to new places. It isn't about going overseas. It's actually about being sent into those places we are already positioned. For those of us who live with family, we are sent as witnesses to our family. Whether they're Christians, we're sent as witnesses to those who are Christians of God's goodness and his love and what he's done for us. Or whether they're not Christians yet, we're sent as witnesses of who God is. For those of us who are working and go to our workplaces, we are sent into those places as witnesses, ambassadors for Jesus, representatives, helping to show others what difference Jesus can make to our lives. In the places where we live and we spend our time, we are sent as Jesus' disciples among our friends and with our neighbours. Some of us are, are being called to serve Jesus in, in, the, in a hospital. Some of us are being called to serve Jesus in a school. Some of us are called to serve Jesus in law. Some of us are called to serve Jesus in business or in politics um, or at the uh, recycling centre. Wherever we are, whatever we are doing, we are called to be a witness for Jesus. We are co to consider ourselves sent by him into these places. Whom shall I send? Here am I. Send me. However, I think many of us, we feel inadequate to this task. When Isaiah is confronted with a vision of God's powerful holiness, he cries out, woe to me, I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips. Or as a message puts it, I quite like the message version, doom, it's doomsday, I'm as good as dead. He feels utterly unworthy, totally inadequate. He has nothing to offer. I suspect many of us feel the same when it comes to sharing our faith with others. We, we feel inadequate. We feel unworthy. We feel we have nothing to offer. And this is where John 20 is key for us to understand what it says and what Jesus says to his disciples. Let me, uh, let me first ask you a question before we, we go on to that. When Jesus commissions his disciples, he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. I wonder if you would just like to chat with the person near to you or a person near to you. In what way was Jesus sent by his father? And there's lots of answers to this. There's not one answer. How was Jesus sent by his father? Do you want to just have a, have a chat, just share any thought you have, have if you'd like to? How did Jesus come to us? How was he sent by his father? And then uh, if anyone wants to share that, to those who are with us online, if you want to post anything on chat, you're very welcome to, and I can read, read those thoughts out.
It's a really rich question, and I, I think it is one that the church can think about a long time, about how should we be sent to the communities around us? How should we reach out to people? How should we uh, be as a church in our community? Anyone want to offer any ideas? And as I say, there's lots of different ways that, that we could answer this question. I know some of you were talking, but it might, might have been about yesterday's football or whatever ever else. Yeah, yeah. And actually, the whole thinking of Jesus came as a baby. He came not as, as a lord to lord it over people, but actually came in humility. Um, yeah, came very, very vulnerably. Yeah, thank you, B. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, in, interesting, when Jesus sends out the 70 for mission, um, he tells them to go to people's home and, and to actually be dependent on the people that he's going to to provide for their physical needs. It's really interesting that, you know, rather than we've got it all together and we've got all the answers. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. Matt. Yeah, so within the Jewish community, and that's quite key in terms of the whole Old Testament and the way Jesus fulfilled the prophecies about who he was. Yeah, but he came, he came I think, uh, perhaps, I don't know if you mean this, but it, as a particular person, actually, it's about neighbourhood, isn't it? It's about relating to people. Yeah, not, it didn't come in a general sense, it came in a specific sense. Yeah, that's, thank you, Matt. Yeah, yeah. So he came with the Father's direction and the Spirit's empowering. And we're going to come to that in a moment because I, I think that's picked up on in the text. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Hugh. That's Jill, you were saying he he came he was sent as a baby, we just thought, but he he was a human. He grew up in sin and he was tired and hungry and yeah. he experienced similar things but the same things as we do. Yeah, yeah, he became one of us, I think as yeah. one of the songs puts it, doesn't it? Yeah. And some really, really rich things. Go on, Gabriel, we'll have one last Yeah, yeah. So he sees everyone as equal and he treats everyone with respect and dignity and, yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, if, if any bias in Jesus, it's towards those who other people write off, isn't it? But he actually lifts up those who are often written off by others. Really, really rich reflections. And um, we could say gen he came gently, he came humbly, he came sacrificially, he came to the marginalised. I, and the actual text picks up one particular thing that, that Sarah mentioned, because he came empowered by the Spirit. And for what we're talking about today, about us being sent, I think this is a key thing. For those of us who feel we can't do it, this is a key thing to take home with us. So in verse uh, 21, Jesus says, Just as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And then in verse 22, he says, And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The, the direct link about how Jesus was sent and how we are sent is the Holy Spirit. We are not sent on our own. We are sent with the same enabling presence of the Holy Spirit to witness to the truth about God as Jesus came. Eileen Bradbury writes, during the middle of a five-year drought in Zimbabwe, I was in the garden trying to keep the remaining plants alive by pouring leftover dishwater on them when it began to rain. For days we'd been hiring a boy to haul buckets of water on our small plot just to keep the green plants alive. It took him all day to get the bucket full and cover the half acre plot. But in five minutes of heavy rain, the whole garden had been soaked. It would have taken thousands of hours, millions of buckets and hundreds of people to do what God did in five minutes. That is the difference in whether we do something in our own strength or in the power of God's Spirit. 
It's never been God's intention that we are sent alone, that we are somehow adequate to do this. It's always been God's intention that, that we go relying on the Holy Spirit and being empowered by the Holy Spirit. I love evangelist D.L. Moody. Um, he was a late 19th century. He was known for his reliance on the Holy Spirit. He once planned to have a campaign in England, and the story goes that an elderly pastor protested, why do we need this, to Mr. Moody? He's uneducated and inexperienced. Who does he think he is, anyway? Does he think he has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? To which a younger, wiser pastor rose and responded, no, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Mr. Moody. I love that quote because actually that's what we're invited to do. We're invited to allow the Holy Spirit to have a monopoly on us, to be filled by the Holy Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit in every situation that, that we face. We've got it wrong if we think the Holy Spirit was given for the church just for 10.30 on a Sunday morning. That, that's not why the Holy Spirit was given. The Holy Spirit was given to the church for 10.30 on a Monday morning and 10.30 on a Tuesday morning and, and 7 o'clock on a Wednesday evening. The Holy Spirit is given to, to enable us to fulfill what God wants us to do in our lives and witness for Jesus day in, day out, 24-7. We're commanded in Ephesians 5, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as Moody himself once said, he said elsewhere, the fact is we're leaky vessels and we have to keep right under the fountain all the time. So we say, whom shall I send? We say, here am I, send me. But we can only do this through the empowering presence of God's Spirit. But God has promised to fill us with his Spirit as we ask him. Let me just do, cover one more area, because a word of warning. Because just because we're called to do something, and, and just because we have the Holy Spirit with us, and the Holy Spirit's presence, it doesn't mean it will always be easy. When I was 21, I did an internship in, my, um, in the church where I'd become a Christian four years earlier. I thought Christian work would be um, almost like I, you wake up in the morning and you kind of float through the day and have this one spiritual high after another and after another. And I found pretty quickly it wasn't like that. It was like any other job and it was pretty hard work. Yet I knew I was where God wanted me to be. And, and the truth is that just because we're called, just because we have the Holy Spirit, doesn't mean it will always be easy. Many of you know that I began here at this church, um, it would be 12 years in summer, and, uh, and when I came, we, the church, we found out a week after I was here, we faced um, some horrific uh, news that, that a previous minister had been arrested for child sex offences, and we had to deal with the fallout as a church, and the hurt and the brokenness that came and came to light at that moment. Just because we are called, just because we have the Holy Spirit, doesn't mean it will be easy. Isaiah, I, I'm fascinated by Isaiah's call. If you read on in Isaiah, you actually find out what he's called to do. God says to him in verse 9, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous, make their eyes dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. The, what Isaiah is called to do is, is to share that, that the people actually are under God's judgment for the way that they're behaving, to turn back to God, but they're not going to do it. That's what God is saying here. They're, they're not going to do it. And then Isaiah said, how long, Lord? And God answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as a terebinth and oak leave stumps when they're cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. The only glimmer of hope in, in Isaiah's calling is in the last verse where actually God is going to leave a stump. He's not going to utterly destroy everything. But, but Isaiah's calling is to proclaim God's truth, to proclaim uh, who God is, God's righteousness to the people, they're, and they're, they're going to get more stubborn against that truth. And they're going to turn away. Isaiah has been called, and yet people aren't going to respond to that call. One commentator, Oswald, says, Isaiah's commission, as it is with all servants of God, is not to be successful in a mere human sense, but to be faithful. See, just because God is calling us, just because we have the Holy Spirit, doesn't mean it will always be easy. And some of us are sent into very difficult situations. We are sent to family members who show no interest 
in Christianity. We are sent to colleagues at work, some of whom are hostile to any mention we have of our faith, of Jesus, of the church. Some of us are sent to friends and neighbours who at best are indifferent. And yet we are sent into these situations because we are not called to be successful, but to be faithful. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Isaiah responds, here am I, send me. William Carey responded, here am I, send me. How will we, we respond this morning? Uh, let me just share a story in closing. A few years ago, I heard uh, a man share his testimony and he said that when he was in his 20s, he was suicidal. And he, he desperately sought for God at that time. He said that he tried praying, he went to several churches, he even went to a mosque, and he didn't find God in any of those situations. And in his despair, he made an ultimatum with God. He, he said, God, if you're there, if you're real, I need to know two things. One, that you love me, and two, that you have a plan for my life. And he went further. He actually set a date by which he wanted God to do this for him. And he put it in his diary. And if God hadn't answered those two requests, then he had decided that he would take his life by that date. As the date drew nearer, he woke up one morning and went for a walk in a local park. And there he encountered a woman who also was walking in the park. He later learned she was a nurse. When they came to each other, the woman stopped and she said, I, I hope you don't mind, but I feel God wants you to know he loves you. He has a plan for your life. It's the exact two things that he had said he needed to know from God. Wow. Instantly, this man's life was changed and he knew God was real. He knew that God loved him and he became a christian he joined a church it took him a little bit to find one that that worked for him he got married he had a family he now works as a christian evangelist he closed his testimony by saying this i am so grateful to that woman that she was obedient to the leading of the holy spirit he said so is my wife and so are my children the lord invites us to be like this nurse this woman to be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit, to speak the words that we feel prompted to speak and to share, to be witnesses to those who don't know him, to join with the Lord in helping others know who he is. And so I, I invite you this morning, how will you respond? We respond as Isaiah did. We respond as William Carey did. We respond as that nurse did. Here am I, send me. I want to, to give a, an opportunity this morning. We're going to respond in worship, and the band might like to just come forward. But as we do so, we're going to sing a couple of songs in response. But I, I brought some oil with me and would like to offer to anoint you with oil. If you would like to say to God today, yes, I'm willing to, to do this. I'm willing to fulfill as much as I can your commission. And, and the oil is a symbol of, of setting apart. It's actually us saying to God, yes, I want to do this. And I can either anoint your head or I can anoint your hand. And if lots of you want to be anointed, Paul's going to come and help me as well. We've, we've not won't had the cameras, we'll, we'll just do it at the front here. And if you'd like to be anointed, set apart, saying to God, yes, I want to respond. Here am I, send me. Then come forward during the next couple of songs and we'll anoint you during that time. I'm going to hand over to Jill to lead us in our response.